these carburetors, Tom. Looks like you're starting your own private collection. Hi, Tech. Yeah, after learning all about carburetors in our fundamental session, I'm going into the business in a big way. Seriously, Tech, I'm getting ready for a session on carburetor linkages and adjustments. Hank said he'd fill me in on the main points, so maybe you can help me over the rough spots. Be glad to, Tom. I guess Hank's ready to get started. Here he comes now with another carburetor. Okay, Tom. I guess these different models will give us a good workout. How about a tech? Is he ready to move on to linkages and adjustments? He soaked up fundamentals like he'd never have another chance. So he should be ready to learn about the finer points of carburetor servicing. To begin with, Tom, you'll notice that each of these carburetors has a slightly different linkage and lever arrangement. However, since they all end up doing the same things, when you understand one, the rest are easy. Let's look at the rods and levers on this ball and ball carburetor. The accelerator pump arm is connected by the accelerator pump rod to the throttle lever. That means that throttle movement controls accelerator pump movement. The curb idle speed adjusting screw in the throttle lever holds the throttle open a small amount to control the flow of inlet air for the curb idle mixture. On the same side of the carburetor, the choke shaft fast idle lever is linked by a connector rod to the fast idle cam so that choke movement controls fast idle cam position. In other words, when the choke closes, the fast idle cam moves to fast idle position. Then, as the choke gradually opens, the cam continues to follow choke movement until it reaches off position with a choke valve open. There's a separate adjusting screw on the throttle lever to set fast idle speed. The fast idle speed adjusting screw contacts the fast idle cam and limits the amount the throttle can close when the cam is in operating position. When the cam moves to off position, the fast idle screw no longer limits throttle closing, and the curb idle screw takes over the speed adjusting function. An unloader tang on the throttle lever contacts a similar tang on the fast idle cam as the throttle lever nears the wide open position. This moves the fast idle cam and mechanically opens the choke valve part way. Now on the other side of the carburetor, we have the choke vacuum diaphragm. When the engine starts, the diaphragm's center stem pulls inward, causing the choke operating link and the choke lever to move the choke valve open part way. Just remember that all the action of the carburetor linkage is interrelated to make the carburetor systems work together efficiently. If adjustments or settings get out of kilter for any reason, you've got trouble on your hands. I can see how all these parts work together, but I don't understand why some of these rods have those fancy bends. And why is the linkage so loose? There are good reasons for both. Let's begin with the shape of the rods. You'll notice that some rods are shaped so they'll line up with their levers and clear other parts when they operate. And most rods have an offset so you can make an adjustment without cocking the rod or causing interference. When you adjust a rod, always bend it at the place indicated in your service manual, or the ends may bind in the levers. Make sure the linkage moves freely through its full travel range after you make an adjustment. Don't let looseness and the linkages fool you, Tom. Adjustments and settings stay right where they're supposed to be if the carburetor is set to specifications. The slack is taken up when the carburetor is in operation. Is there a reason for that looseness? There sure is, Tom. That looseness makes the linkage less sensitive to sticking caused by dirt or gum. Of course, there's a limit to the amount of dirt a linkage can tolerate. Some parts, like the fast idle linkage, can stick more easily than others. The fast idle linkage must be clean so it can drop freely to off position by its weight alone when the choke is open. The linkage is supposed to operate dry. Oiling may cause it to stick, especially at the fast idle cam pivot. Okay, Tech, I get the message. But back to that bit about adjustments. Why should carburetor linkage need adjustment if it's set right to start with? Well, for one thing, worn parts can change settings. But we're also up against carburetors thrown out of whack by someone who bent the linkage or change settings without understanding what he was doing. Some fellas try to fix stalling or stumble by tinkering with a carburetor or choke setting 
when the real cause is somewhere in the ignition system or even mechanical trouble. Just make sure that ignition and compression are okay before you blame the carburetor for poor performance. Right. And even if the carburetor is causing the trouble, just bending rods or changing settings may put in more trouble than it takes out. For example, when you bend the accelerator pump rod, it changes the pump stroke and the relationship between the distance the throttle valve opens and the amount of fuel the accelerator pump discharges. This makes adjustment very critical. If the rod's too long, the pump won't deliver enough gas and the engine may stumble or falter on acceleration. Where the rod's short, the pump delivers too much gas and usually causes a delayed acceleration stumble. That suggests a question. I noticed in the service manual that the accelerator pump was adjusted with the pump rod in the medium stroke hole of the throttle lever. When do you use the long or the short stroke holes? First of all, the middle stroke hole setting is best for most general driving conditions. The other two holes should be used only where exceptional conditions require a greater or smaller pump discharge. For example, in cold climates, a long pump stroke usually gives the best acceleration performance. Where the weather is usually hot, it's best to use the short stroke setting. How about the bowl vent, Hank? If the vent stays closed when the engine is shut off, you could have a hot starting problem. A closed vent will allow heat expansion to force vapor or raw fuel out of the carburetor and flood the engine. The vent should be open only at curb idle. Above that speed, an open vent can cause the carburetor to run too rich, especially if the air cleaner is partly clogged. And don't forget the choke unloader adjustment. If for any reason the engine is flooded and the unloader doesn't open the choke properly, your customer could grind the starter to pieces trying to get the engine started. We don't have time now to go into adjustment details covered in the service manuals, so I guess we'd better go on to choke linkages. Linkages? I thought there was only one choke linkage system. It's a single system, but it does two separate jobs. So it has an operating linkage and a fast idle linkage. First, the choke closes to help the engine start. With the choke closed, manifold vacuum draws fuel from the carburetor when the engine is cranking. After the engine starts, the vacuum diaphragm pulls the choke open just enough to regulate the mixture needed for smooth power during warm-up. At the same time, the fast idle cam keeps the cold engine running fast enough to prevent stalling at idle speed. As the engine warms up, the choke gradually opens and moves the fast idle cam to off position, where it remains until you begin the cold starting cycle again. Now let's go over the linkage itself. Choke operating linkage includes the thermostatic coil spring in the manifold well and a rod hooked to the choke valve lever. The coil winds up when cold and closes the choke valve when the fast idle linkage is released. The choke vacuum diaphragm overcomes the closing force of the thermostatic coil and pulls the choke valve part way open as soon as the engine starts. This opening action is what we call the vacuum kick. Vacuum kick adjustment is another very critical setting, Tom. It controls cold engine performance and fuel economy during the warm-up period. You'll notice that the choke valve is mounted off-center so that intake air can push on the wide section to help open the choke. Some models have a choke staging spring, which allows the choke valve to open part way when the engine is cranking. This allows the engine to breathe and helps cold starting, especially at zero or below when the thermostatic coil has closed the choke valve tightly. And that about closes the choke on our story, until someone turns the record. All our carburetors now have a modulating spring, which works with the choke vacuum diaphragm to open the choke valve gradually as the engine warms up. Without this modulating spring, the valve would stay in a fixed position during warm-up. Here's how it works. The modulating spring is fully compressed when the vacuum diaphragm pulls the choke partly open against the closing force of the thermostatic coil. Then, as choke closing force decreases, the modulating spring gradually opens the choke. 
You've already seen that the fast idle linkage includes a fast idle lever on the choke valve shaft, a connecting rod, and the fast idle cam. Also included is the fast idle speed adjusting screw on the throttle lever. There are two adjustments here, Tom. Rod length sets the fast idle cam in proper relation to the choke valve. The idle speed screw adjusts fast idle speed. Check your service manuals for details. When the choke valve is completely open, the linkage rotates the fast idle cam steps away from the fast idle speed adjusting screw. The cam stays in this off position until the thermostatic coil again cools enough to close the choke. Of course, as you know, the accelerator pedal must be pressed part way down when starting a cold engine. This lets the fast idle cam rotate, and this in turn allows the choke to close. I've got a question, Hank. You said the choke opened gradually as the engine warmed up. But when should the choke close again, provided the fast idle cam is released? I'll answer that one, Tom. The choke valve should be lightly closed when thermostatic choke coil temperature is about 75 degrees. You should feel definite resistance to opening pressure at low temperatures. In sunny areas where underhood temperature is high, even before an initial start, the thermostatic coil will be relaxed and the choke valve may not close at all. The choke thermostatic coil is calibrated to give starting and warm-up operation that suits specific engine needs all year round. No special winter or summer settings are necessary. And don't get any ideas about trying to get more gas mileage by moving the choke setting to the lean side. Actually, you can cause stalling or sluggishness if you set these chokes on the lean side for any reason. You'll notice in the specs that no choke is set on the L side. Those L and R marks are almost an invitation to change the setting. <laughs> you better not. Those marks are there for setting the choke at the factory. Only reset a choke when it's out of specs, or a service bulletin calls for a new setting. One more thing. The thermostatic coils are tailored to fit the needs of specific carburetors and engines, so don't get the part numbers mixed, or try to substitute one choke for another, even if they look alike. Anything else on chokes, Hank? No, I guess we can go on to float settings. Tom, you'll remember from the fundamentals that a high fuel level makes the mixture too rich and can waste plenty of gas. High fuel level can make the engine hard to start, hot or cold, because the rich mixture can flood the manifold with liquid gasoline. And the engine may load up at idle and low speeds because the main discharge nozzles can start delivering gas while the idle and transfer systems are still feeding fuel. How about low fuel level? Where the float setting's low, the mixture runs lean because fuel delivery is reduced and the high speed system begins to feed later than normal. As a result, the engine may lose power and act sluggish, especially if the throttle is opened slowly when picking up from low speeds. Also, you may notice some spark knock when the mixture is too lean. Low fuel level can also cause cold starting problems. This usually happens when cold weather cranking is too slow to provide a good mixture for starting. Any questions, Tom? What about flooding, where gas runs out of the carburetor? <laughs> That's really high fuel level. But it usually happens only if the float sticks, or the inlet valve is held open by dirt or other foreign material in the gas. Normal float pressure is enough to seat the inlet valve properly. But if the synthetic rubber valve tip is compressed when you adjust the float, you'll have a fault setting, one that will be too low when the valve tip returns to normal shape. Just be careful when you bend the float lip for float level adjustment. Stay clear of the inlet valve so there'll be no pressure on the valve tip to cause distortion. The float lip and inlet valve must be within 10 degrees of a right angle when the adjustment is completed. This will allow the valve to move freely in the valve seat. If the lip is bent too far, angular thrust can cock the valve in its seat when float pressure closes the valve. This can jam the valve or cause wear that will change the float setting. When the float's adjusted and you're putting the carburetor together, don't forget to attach the model identification tag. 
The next technician who works on the carburetor will also need the model number so he can apply the right specs for adjustment. Good point, Tech. It's easy to mix up different models of the same type carburetor. How are we doing, Tom? Are all systems go? You've given me plenty to remember already, but I want to learn all I can about carburetors. So what's next? Idle and low speed systems, Tom. You'll remember that the fast idle cam holds the throttle partly open to keep the engine from stalling at idle speed when the choke is on. However, throttle valves must be nearly closed for curb idle adjustments. So make sure the engine's fully warmed up and the fast idle cam is completely off before you adjust the idle speed and mixture. And throttle valve closing brings us to valve alignment. Always check the valve alignment of any carburetor you work on because the throttle has to close all the way for some adjustments. Right, Tech. A damaged or cocked valve will jam against the throttle bore and stay partly open even when the speed adjusting screw is backed away from its stop. Checking throttle valve alignment is easy. Just back out the idle speed adjusting screw and close the throttle. Then hold the carburetor up to the light and sight into the throttle bore. If light shows evenly on all sides of the valve, it's probably aligned properly. Where more light shows on one side than the other, the valve is cocked and must be realigned. Dual throttle valves must close the same amount. Any variation between the two will throw valves out of register with the idle ports and make idle adjustment balance a tough job. And make sure the valves are put in right side up. If either or both valves are turned over, they can't close correctly and may jam on the throttle bores. How do throttle valves get out of alignment, Hank? It usually happens when somebody gets careless and bumps the throttle valve edges against a hard surface. Just a tap can cause valve interference. The best way to protect throttle valves is to mop the carburetor on extension legs or use a good carburetor holding fixture so that the valves are raised off the work surface. Does that wrap up valve alignment, Hank? That's all for now. Idle adjustments are next. Here again, your service manuals describe the adjustments in detail. But there are a few important points that we should talk about. A rich idle mixture can cause a noticeable drop in gas economy, especially if the car is used mostly in stop and go city driving, where you do lots of waiting for stoplights and traffic jams. And with a rich mixture, the added gas cools the throttle valves, so there's more chance of running into that old complaint, carburetor icing. You can usually cut down on icing stalls if you adjust idle mixture on the lean side to lessen the cooling effect and set idle speed at the high limit to reduce ice clogging at the throttle valve edges. You'll be wasting your time if you try to cure an icing complaint without first making sure the manifold heat control valve is working properly. If the valve sticks open, the slow warm-up can give you double trouble. Icing and slow choke opening. Stuck closed, it'll overheat the carburetor and you'll have stalling and hot start problems. Keep the valve free with a few drops of Mopar Manifold Heat Control Valve Solvent. Finally, there's the crankcase ventilator valve. You already know that idle mixture becomes rich if the valve plugs or sticks closed, or lean if it sticks open. If the valve acts up, simply change it and readjust the idle. But be sure it's the right one because orifice sizes are different. Valves for 170 cubic inch engines have a bright finish end washer. All others have a black washer. That just about wraps it up for this session. You'll find the things covered in this film, plus other helpful information on service adjustments in your reference book. Read it over carefully and keep your book handy for everyday use. When you understand why service adjustments are important and how incorrect settings affect performance, you'll be able to do a better job of diagnosing carburetor troubles. And whatever you do, follow the instructions given in your service manual for adjusting each model carburetor you work on. Turn out every carburetor job carefully, and you'll have customers calling you the carburetor expert. See you next month.
Thank you.